Okay, so when I started writing Toy Story 3, I thought I knew what a decent second act break was. Generally, it's the moment where you force the stakes of your story. So with Toy Story 3, the toys get to sunny side daycare, and it turns out to be a prison. So their midpoint goal is, we got to get out of here, we got to get back to Andy. So then the whole third quarter of the film is just a big set piece where they execute this elaborate escape from Sunnyside, and they get up to the cusp of freedom... And then they get busted by Lotso, and now it looks like they're going to be prisoners again. Okay, so what I'm going to show you now is from the earliest set of reels, before they were even complete, sometimes very early on, Pixar does what they call a storybook version of the reels, where there's no recorded dialogue, you just do sketches of the movie, and then you have a narrator coming in and telling you what happens. So this is just super primitive, super early storytelling, but again, we were following the template of what I thought a good second act break should be. So here it is, the earliest version of the second act break of Toy Story 3. At the bottom of the dark and slimy chute, they find themselves in a high-walled chamber, open to the stars above. Freedom. Rex accidentally trips an electric eye. A loud motor starts, and the floor of the chamber begins sliding open, revealing a dark pit of crushed garbage below. The floor slowly disappears into the wall until just a narrow ledge remains. Then abruptly, the motor stops. They hear the sound of clapping and look up to see Lotso and his gang perched above them, <laughs> waiting. They've been caught. Lotso belittles the toys. What are you doing, running back to your kid? He don't love you. You think you're special? You're a piece of plastic. You are made to be thrown away. In Lotso's warped worldview, kids use toys and toys use kids. Woody counters with an impassioned speech that defends the bond between toy and owner. The daycare toys are seduced. When Lotso sees the effect Woody's words are having on his own gang, he makes fun of them. There is no love. Never was. Well, what about Daisy? Lotso flinches. Woody reveals the close bond that once existed between Lotso and Daisy. Lotso vilifies Daisy, but his harsh words confuse Big Baby. Woody produces a small locket given to him by Chuckles the Clown back at Bonnie's house. He tosses it to Lotso, who laughs and crushes it under his foot. A tear drips down from Big Baby's eye. He cries, Mama. then picks up a struggling Lotso and throws him into the garbage pit. He's gone. Everyone cheers. Things are going to be different at Sunnyside from now on. How can we repay you? By treating toys fairly. Equal work for equal play. We're all in this together, right? As the toys celebrate, a filthy Lotso suddenly pulls a pin from a safety chain, and Andy's toys tumble into the pit with him. Just then, they hear the sound of an approaching garbage truck. The dumpster is suddenly lifted and emptied into the back of the garbage truck. As the truck drives away, the toys struggle to find each other in the dark, smelly interior. The truck pulls into the county dump. So we bring this in, we screen it for the Brain Trust, and the verdict is, Andrew Stanton says, I don't buy it. Like, I don't buy Woody giving this heroic speech and having all the daycare toys suddenly realize, oh, wait a minute, like, Lotso's a bad guy. Like Andrew said, look, the toys at Sunnyside are not stupid. They already know that Lotso's a bad guy. They don't need Woody to give them a big speech to turn the tide against him. So the whole thing doesn't ring true, and it's just not satisfying. So the question becomes, like, what are we missing? Like, what is going wrong here? So again, sometimes it's helpful just to go back up to 30,000 feet and analyze your story in purely formal terms. You go, okay... What usually happens in the second act break of a story? Like usually you're creating a crisis in all three sets of stakes of your story. So in Toy Story 3, the external stakes are the toy's future. Like are they going to end up in a nice safe home or are they going to end up at the dump? Then the internal stakes are all about Andy, right? Does Andy still care about the toys or not? And what's philosophically at stake in the story is like is the love between a child and a toy real? Like is it something that is real and lasting or is it just fleeting and illusory? So if you look at this version of the second act break externally, all the toys have been taken off of the dump, and that's a huge setback in the external stakes of the story, right? There's also a huge setback in the internal stakes, right? Because it seems like the toys won't see Andy again, and they'll never have a chance to reciprocate or receive his love, right? However, in this version of the story, like Woody wins his argument against Lotso because he convinces everybody that the love between a child and a toy is real. And now obviously one of these things is not like the other, right? You're losing in your external stakes. You're losing in your internal stakes, but for some reason, because it's badly written, your hero is winning the argument against your villain. So that's the problem, right? Your hero is succeeding in the philosophical stakes of the story. So obviously, 
The solution is your hero, Woody, has to now lose the argument to Lotso. Because, look, if Woody wins the argument with Lotso, then that means that Woody is always right, which means the philosophical stakes of your story are never in doubt, which means your story never challenges your audience and your story is boring. However, if Woody loses the argument with Lotso, that means that Woody is uncertain, he's confused, it means that he has depth and complexity as a hero, it means that the philosophical stakes of the story are in doubt, and it means that your story is challenging your audience and hopefully your story is not boring. So at the end of the second act, your hero is going to fail externally, he's going to fail internally, and he's also going to fail philosophically. Woody has to lose the argument to Lotso. So here it is, the finished second act break of Toy Story 3. I'm sorry, cowboy. <gasps> they broke me. What are y'all doing? Running back to your kid? He don't want you no more. That's a lie. Is it? Tell me this, Sheriff. If your kid loves you so much, why is he leaving? You think you're special, cowboy? You're a piece of plastic. You were made to be thrown away. Speak of the devil. Now we need toys in our caterpillar room and you need to avoid that truck. Why don't you come on back, join our family again? This isn't a family, it's a prison. You're a liar and a bully and I'd rather rot in this dumpster than join any family of yours. Jesse's right. Authority should derive from the consent of the governed, not from the threat of force. If that's what you want. So what you're doing here, right, is having Woody lose the argument to Lotso. And you have Jesse say, you know, this place is a prison and you're a coward and a bully and you give Barbie the zinger about the consent of the governor. But Woody has always felt this huge attachment to Andy, right? This duty to always be there for him. And now Andy is leaving and going off to college. And Lotso says, if your kid loves you so much, why is he leaving? And Woody doesn't have an answer. And I remember there was a moment sort of halfway through the process. We've been working on the script for about a year and a half. And in the middle of a story meeting, Andrew Stanton suddenly just says, like, wait, wait a minute. Like, what is Lotso doing in our movie? Like, it's not just enough to make him a bad guy. Like, why is he here? Like, what is he contributing to the story? So then, great. Like, now we have to sit down and spend, like, a year, like, trying to figure out, like, who Lotso is. So a lot of times, right, your bad guy is, like, the dark doppelganger of your hero. Like, your villain is there to illuminate the deepest fears and insecurities of your hero. So logically, Lotso should represent a sort of repressed dark side of Woody's character. So then the question becomes, obviously, like, what is Woody's dark side? What is Woody's greatest fear? And one of the best bits of story advice I ever heard was at one point, Andrew said, like, if there's an ugly truth in your story, you cannot avoid it. Like, if you try to avoid it, your audience is going to sense that you're just bullshitting them, right? If there's an ugly truth in your story, you need to turn the steering wheel and drive straight at it. And the ugly truth about toys is that they're essentially disposable. Like, nobody keeps their toys forever, right? Everyone outgrows their toys and eventually leaves them behind, right? And I remember Andrew saying, like, that is the ugly truth at the center of this movie, and we can't hide from it. So what we came up with was the idea that philosophically, Lotso's view is that toys are inherently tragic figures, right? Because toys naturally fall in love with children, and children always grow up, and they always leave their toys behind. So Lotso believes that any toy that falls in love with a child is just a sucker, right? Because they're always going to get betrayed in the end. So Lotso just doesn't think that the love between a child and a toy is real, right? Because toys always get left behind. And when he says to Woody, like, if your kid loves you so much, why is he leaving? He's poking at this nagging doubt that Woody has in the back of his mind that maybe Andy is leaving the toys because he doesn't really care about them anymore. And you have to remember that Woody has gone through two and a half movies saying that the job of a toy is to be there for Andy. Like in his mind, love means always being there. But now, like Andy's going off to college and Lotso is asking a question that goes right to the darkest heart of Woody's fears. And Woody doesn't have an answer. So for your second act break, you're creating a crisis in the external stakes of your story and in the internal stakes of your story, but you're also creating a crisis in the philosophical stakes of your story, and there should be no way out of that crisis. So your bad guy is going to poke at your hero and taunt him and provoke his deepest fears and insecurities, and your hero doesn't have an answer. Where's your kid now, Sheriff? You want it to seem like a hero has failed not just externally and internally, but philosophically too. So, for example, like at the end of the second act of It's a Wonderful Life, right, Mr. Potter says to George Bailey, well, George Bailey... Miserable little clerk crawling in here on your hands and knees and begging for help. No securities, no stocks, no bonds, nothing but a miserable little $500 equity and a life insurance policy. <laughs> You're worth more dead than alive. 
you're worth more dead than alive, right? And George Bailey goes, oh my God, he's right. Like, I, like I'm just going to go kill myself now because at least, you know, Donna Reed and my kids are going to have money for my insurance policy. And I just think that Mr. Potter is one of the great screen villains of all time because his worldview is so clear and convincing that it just feels irrefutable, right? Like he's the richest man in town and everybody knows it. What about all your other friends? Well, they don't have that kind of money, Mr. Potter. You know that. You're the only one in town that can help me. So when Mr. Potter says to George Bailey, like, you're worth more dead than alive, like, you in the audience, you sit there, you go, well, he's being kind of a dick about it, but he's basically right. Like, Mr. Potter's richer, George Bailey's poor, and there's just no getting around that fact. Okay, so the lesson learned is that for your second act break, you've got to create a crisis in all three sets of stakes, and you want to have your hero and the audience not be able to see any way out of those crises until you get to the story's climax.